point. Um, okay, so moving on. Next up, we're going to talk about um, a people's school partnership and the role of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society's Community Navigator. Uh, so Pauline McIntosh joins us from St. FX Extension Department, where she has been instrumental in designing and delivering the Extension Department's Rural Leadership Development Program. Through this program, Pauline has brought people together to discuss community-based approaches to development and led engaging discussions that bridge theory and practice. She's joining us today to talk about how two organizations came together in March of 2018 to host a conversation about affordable housing in Nova Scotia and how that led to the understanding of the importance of the role of a community navigator. And Pauline, I'm sorry, I'm remiss in not, you have colleagues here with you as well, and if you could share their names or maybe you could wave because I didn't jot down accurate names, I'm afraid I'm gonna get one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can, thank you. so thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, uh, David and others, for, for welcoming us today and inviting us to be part of this really incredible conversation. It's absolutely heartening to see so many people out here to have this important discussion with the sunlight shining in through the windows and knowing that perhaps that won't be here with us much longer. So really pleased to be here and thank you. And I would like to introduce two of my dear friends and colleagues. I have Lise de Villiers, who is a board member of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society over here. Show of hands, Lise. <laughs> and also very pleased to introduce Carlton McNeil. And Carlton is the community navigator with the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society. And you're going to hear a lot more about Carlton's role uh, through my presentation and I'm sure through discussion with him as we spend time here today. So thank you. Is this the clicker? Yes. Okay. I'm uh, known to be terrible with clickers, so please forgive me. I'll apologize up front. So my presentation might be slightly different than some others that you'll hear today. It's really a story that I want to tell you about a process that's been happening around affordable housing in our area. And as was mentioned, I work with the St. Evex Extension Department. And the Extension Department has been around for about 90 years. I haven't been here for all of them. I'll let you know that up front. <laughs> but the Extension Department formed sort of as a result of a groundswell movement that was happening early in the 1920s and 30s. And that was, has become internationally renowned Antigonish movement. And that movement is about collective action and adult education. And one of the main tenets of the Antigonish movement in the early days was something called a people's school. And a people's school was spawned by great leaders of the movement, like Reverend Jimmy Tompkins, uh, who was really designed to bring people together and to talk about issues that were really of importance to them at that time. And today, we think of a people's school very, very similarly, a place where folks come together uh, opening a space where the people's learnings and their experience and their expertise and their knowledge are the basis of the conversation that happens. So it's learning led by the people. And this year happens to be the 90th anniversary of the St. Evex Extension Department. And one of the pieces of work that we continue to do today is really try to be engaged in our community and help community-based organizations and groups achieve their own vision. And full disclosure, this led us to working with the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society this year, but the disclosure part is that I'm also a board member with Antigonish Affordable Housing. So I play a bit of a dual role. And this is quite common because so many of us are really involved in our communities, not only as volunteers, but in the work that we do. And as part of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society's role, it's not only to try to build and create sustainable, supported, community-based housing, but it's also to illuminate the discussion around the need for affordable housing and what our vision might be for the future. So the mission of that society is stated here, and it's to research and develop opportunities to create affordable housing, and provide social support for the residents of our developments. And it's interesting, I think it was John who was reading the, the roll-up uh, banner for affordable housing here this morning and said, that mission's almost exactly the same as ours. 
So we know there are many organizations across the province who are doing similar kinds of work and really trying to forward a more uh, a, a vision that we can, we can all subscribe to that brings greater quality of life to the people who live in, in these developments. So these two organizations, the St. Evax Extension Department and the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society decided to partner. And we decided to partner around opening the conversation. And we decided to do that through a traditional mechanism of extension, the People's School. And you'll see here, this was the advertisement that we put out way back in February. And it just invited people to come and be part of a conversation about what affordable housing could be. The event happened on March 24th, and I see some familiar faces in, in the room today. Jack Fancy was with us, as well as Nancy Lee, and perhaps some others. And people came, about over 60 people showed up. We had 90 registered, but there were a bit of adverse weather in certain parts of the province. <laughs> and so the lesson from that was, even though it's the end of March, perhaps just wait till the middle of April to try to have a big discussion like this. But we we're really, really pleased, and the people who were there were the absolute right people to have the discussion that day. And in the contemporary version of the People's School, it was really designed to create the space where people's knowledge and experience could be shared, where we could build awareness of what else is happening in our shared environment, in our shared context, and not only building on our own experience, but bringing in new information as well, co-creating, learning from others, and talking about what's innovative and how can we collaborate to move innovations forward. Finally, there was a lot of networking and linkages that were built during that day, and hopefully people were inspired to some action. And as we're hearing throughout the day today, there are a lot of really interesting things happening. We see Jack Fancy here working with some other folks. Part of that day was talking about what would be an amenable vision for affordable housing in the province. We talked about what are some of the factors out there that are hindering us from realizing this vision and what are some of the factors that are helping. And then we did a lot of strategic thinking about how we could build on the, the helpful factors how we could really mobilize our assets and our resources, and how we could mitigate or minimize the, the hindering factors. And that led to thinking about some concrete actions. And it wasn't about any particular group in the room, uh, neither the Extension Department nor the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society or any others leading a whole plan of action, but how could each of us take a part of that and work within our own context to move that agenda forward, move more closely to the vision of affordable housing that we all saw as positive. So the connection with the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society, because I want to talk about the partnership, but also one of the key learnings that came out of that people's school or one of the points that really resonated with folks was the role of the community navigator. So I want to move to that discussion a little bit. But the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society itself has existed for about 25 years. And I was talking with some folks uh, before we began this morning, we're, and we're asking, how did you get this done? How did you achieve all this? And it's been a long time coming. It's been many, many years of working and having periods of less activity and less, less growth that has brought us to where we are today. And we're still growing and learning and changing and modifying and, and moving forward as best we can. But it's really about combining uh, resources from uh, whatever support sources we can find it's about providing tenants with a chance to reduce their dependence on, on uh, or they're having to live in poorer quality housing where we could provide good quality, safe, environmentally friendly housing as much as possible. And it's about um, having a strong organization that can help move this, this vision forward. So you'll see up there that the organization started in 1993, went through periods of you know, ebbed and flowed. In 2011, there was sort of a resurgence, got a really strong board, spent a lot of time building the capacity of the organization. In 2014, we were able to get charitable status, which really helped us move through another uh, group of hurdles. 
uh, to the point where last year we opened four new brand new units of housing, and this year we've opened 10 additional ones. We had a community dinner two weeks ago to invite all the, the residents to come together. And if anyone's in Antigonish next Saturday, we'll have a grand opening for the public uh, at 10.30 in the morning. You're all welcome to come. And this is the part of the new construction in, in progress. It's all complete right now, and uh, we're very, very proud to have that. And a key part of this is we constructed a community room along with the residents, the residential units. And this was a big challenge, and some of our board members can tell you that we had to really, really remain stalwart, that this was a very, very important part of our development. And people were telling us at various, various times, you need to be generating rent from every square foot that you build. You can't sustain a community room. And I think it was, the, it was the commitment of the board that we had to have this. If we really wanted to stay true to our mission and fulfill our vision, we needed to create a space where a community could come together. So really, really pleased to have that. So what is the role of the community navigator in all of this? Um, we see it as an absolutely crucial part of our housing strategy the role of the community navigator. This person provides support to the residents from the day they move in until the day that they leave us. We haven't had anyone leave us yet, <laughs> being so early in the process. But this is an essential role. And they help the tenants access services that exist in our community. They provide support. They do advocacy. They help them access information. Anything that can be done to help the resident be successful in this affordable uh, living environment. And it also, another key aspect of the role is to build community, to bring people together, to build that shared vision for what they want their community in this, this affordable housing development to look like. Creating pathways for involvement in social and leisure activities. So sometimes people just don't know what's out there. And sometimes people are isolated and they need to be uh, apprised of the information and the opportunities that exist for them. And ultimately, we like to think of the role as the community navigator as turning these housing units into homes and doing anything they can to help with that process and see that come to fruition. The community navigator also plays a critical role in leading or facilitating a tenant advisory group, and part of that is sitting on the tenant selection committee initially to ensure, excuse me, to ensure that we're selecting a group of people who are really interested in building housing, and finally facilitating the process for that uh, for that group on an ongoing basis. So having meetings every two weeks or whenever they're needed, but really being an active, vibrant part of the community that's forming. We've got a short video here. I wonder if it's going to load, David? <coughs> Seems to have skipped it. That's OK, because the good news is that Carlton's with us. It's better than having a video. We can ask them questions all day long. So the, the video was just giving a sense of the community navigator in action. So showing some of the day-to-day -day interactions that that navigator might experience uh, in, in the role. So I just want to, before I conclude, and how am I doing for time? Doing great? Two minutes, okay. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Lise de Villiers, who's here, and Lise is representing the governance committee of our board. And the governance committee has been absolutely crucial in ensuring that we stay on track in terms of our values and our vision as an organization. So Lise will be happy to talk with any of you throughout the day today as well. Another uh, uh, Carlton I've introduced, and Carlton will be here to talk with you as well. Another colleague was here with us earlier this morning, Olga Gladkick. And one of the real features of our organization is that we, we really thought about the skills and the expertise and the values of the people we wanted to comprise the board. So Olga is a communications specialist. We knew that we needed to have good communications around the work that we're doing so that this really becomes community-supported housing. We want the community to feel a sense of ownership. 
And so really want to thank Olga. She's responsible for getting a lot of information out there and doing some educational programming in the community to raise awareness. Uh, Denise Davies is a community volunteer who's helped out with the putting several, I think, eight videos together that we can use at events like this and others. Uh, the board of directors of the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society and our volunteers, instrumental in the work that we do, as well as the St. X Extension Department for their ongoing support of this effort. And finally, just wanted to thank uh, the Transition Bay and St. Margaret's Bay Housing Coalition for welcoming us here today. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to, I'll be happy to answer them or to defer to my colleagues in the audience. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about from the community navigator uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. Are there, is there any communication uh, being done with community hospitals uh, for older adults who are admitted in the hospital and are not able to return back home? Um, is, is there a way to facilitate, um, facilitate that conversation between community hospitals and, um, and the residents? Carlton, maybe I'll start and you can join in. So at present, with this particular development, which is called Riverside Estates, we currently have 14 units. Out of those 14 units, we have, I think, three that are barrier-free that can uh, accommodate people with particular physical needs. And we have others that are on the ground floor, others that are on the second floor. So the role of the community navigator is to really be aware of any services in the community that our tenants, our residents, uh, might need to access to support them in their independent living situation. So Carlton has um, certain, certainly been an advocate and walked alongside and accompanied people who might be having the kinds of discussions that you're talking about. We don't have a direct role, though, in, in communicating with the hospital to make these things happen. But if people are residents of our, of our development. Carlton, is there anything that you would add to that? Um, actually, uh, my I, con I have. My oh. <laughs> Uh, I have. I've, I've actually been in the active role with the okay. with uh, tenants for about a year and a half now, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I have actually developed a relationship with the social workers uh, at the hospital. Uh, so whenever a tenant is in a hospital and they have concerns mm -hmm. about something to do with their living arrangement, uh, the social workers will call me and uh, discuss it. Uh, we actually had a tenant uh, who uh, who had suffered a stroke, and uh, they were questioning whether or not they should uh, send him back home. And uh, he did come home, and he needed some uh, uh, medical devices to to uh, help him along in his recovery. And uh, I was able to reach out to the community, to service clubs, and mm -hmm. uh, access uh, support. Uh, to purchase the devices for him, and uh, the guy's doing really well. You can mm -hmm. find him uh, wheeling his wheelchair outside yeah. the unit on the on the sidewalk. So uh, it does work, and the communication takes place, and mm -hmm. that is my role, mm -hmm. to help find the supports that are required for the tenants. Yeah, absolutely. Just and Sorry if I misunderstood, but for our tenants, absolutely, but not on a more general basis for a more public approach. Yeah, but for our tenants, Carlton goes over and above doing advocacy and, and making connections that help people. They do, they do continue to call me, asking me uh, if we have any <laughs> units available, yeah. because they would like to send people to us. So. Yeah. Sorry, we're full. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hi. Hi. Hi, my name is Anastasia. I, I have a question for you about your community room, uh -huh. because that's an interesting aspect yeah. of development. Can you tell me what was the criteria on the size, that you t how you decided it was going to be designed for function? Mm -hmm. Yes, and there might be other people who could tell you more about this, but 
in our current development, and you can visit our display over here a little bit later on if you like, we have a certain footprint within which to work. So we only have a certain space that was allotted to us and, and the, the land was donated by the municipal unit, by the municipality. So we had to work within that footprint. Also, at this particular development, uh, we have 14 units. So we wanted to ensure that the space was adequate to accommodate the residents of the development, but also to host um, other kinds of uh, events, perhaps educational uh, you know, training sessions or whatever might be useful to the group. It also was an economic question. What could we afford to build? So all of those factors, Carlton or Lise, would you add anything else? I think those are the three, that the size of the, the physical footprint that we had to work with, the number of residents who live in the development that we want to accommodate, plus plus, and then the, the actual cost of construction. Yeah. And do you find that the room is utilized, and then so what percentage? Yeah. Well, we've just opened uh, the community room in the last three weeks, and our first event was to host a welcome dinner for all of the residents of the development with board members and other community volunteers. So I think we were able to have a sit-down meal for, well, it was over, it was over 40 people. So we anticipate that that will be part of the work of the tenant advisory group to, as part of their process to decide how they want that room to be used with the input of the board as well. So we'll, we'll host all of our meetings there now, for example, but it'll be really up to what the shared vision of the residents is, how they would like to see it used. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm a little... Does the community room have a kitchen or yes. meal preparation facilities? Yes. And are those, did those have to be up to a certain uh, standard? Yes. Well, Carlton, yes, we definitely have kitchen facilities. Uh, yes, and that is where you have to be careful if you're designing a community room uh, is uh, the intended purpose of it. Uh, if you were going to rent the room out uh, to people outside of your uh, housing development, uh, you would have to consider the public health rules and, and the kitchen facilities would have to be built to the commercial standard. Mm -hmm. If the primary purpose of the, uh, of the community room is for the residents of the uh, residential community, mm -hmm. Uh, then it is actually their space. Mm -hmm. It's a common area space for them, mm -hmm. so the rules are different. So uh, you don't have to have a bunch of commercial sinks mm -hmm. and uh, dishwasher and, and that sort of stuff because the intent would be that the majority of the food that is consumed in the room is brought into the room. And it's just uh, yeah. that you have a serving counter uh, water uh, sinks available for people to wash their hands and what have you. Also, one thing to note too is that at washroom facilities, um, if if the room is being used for outside use, there has to be a barrier between the the food area and mm -hmm. where the washrooms are. So that would automatically require uh, five feet of space uh, for a hallway to the washrooms. But where it is uh, as we intend it to be primarily for the residents, uh, we can have the washrooms just right off the, uh, the space itself. Um, another thing to consider in it is the uh, fire marshal's regulations for uh, access, and if there's barrier-free involved to make sure that uh, the, the access uh, uh, complies with barrier-free requirements. Our, if, if our 14 units were fully uh, occupied according to our rules, our rules are one person per bedroom um, uh, minimum and a maximum of two. So our 14 units uh, fully housed would mean that we could have 37 residents. So our room will accommodate 50 mm -hmm. people. So it's a uh, pretty good size to allow some guests mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Thanks, Carlton. Jack. Okay. So this will be our last question, okay. and then we're going to move on. Thank you, Jack. Okay, good. 
Well, it's actually a two-part question. <laughs> but two, two, two different things. Is this uh, allowed? <laughs> uh, you were talking about you had 14 units and three. It was yeah. three that were barrier-free. Four. Four. Four, four, four barrier-free. Yeah. How do you determine if, say, if uh, I would think that you have, you, you said you had a second story, so you had mm -hmm. steps. There's probably not, you don't have uh, elevators or anything no. like that. No. So, do people who are in, who are uh, still have the use of their legs and such as, mm -hmm. would they be able to apply to say, uh, so that if in sometime in the future, if they came to the point where they couldn't be able to. Uh, fully get up the steps so they could be able to be in line for those four barrier free. Is that how you uh, determine that? Yes. And, and, that? Yeah. And even all, even we had four units opened last year, we've had some movement already from, from one accommodation to another. So right. certainly if we can accommodate that kind of flexibility, we certainly would. I don't know if there's anything else to add to that, Carlton. Basically, what would be would be uh, if, if a tenant was to, if their health was to deteriorate, that they required a very free unit, mm -hmm. we would put them first in line for a very yeah. free unit that became available. Right? So if somebody moved out, they could move in. Mm -hmm. uh, they could also, uh, depending upon the unit that they're in, um, we have just uh, put in the process uh, uh, start installing a mm -hmm. uh, stair lift mm -hmm. for, for one tenant to be able to get upstairs. So there are, are quite a number of the units where uh, an accommodation like that might be uh, possible. Okay. And the other part, how do you determine your, your pricing fees? Well, that's in line with what's the thresholds that are set by set by the province in terms of affordable housing based on the square footage of each unit, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a, definitely a main objective of our organization to ensure that the rents stay absolutely as affordable as possible. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, and uh, thank you, Carlton, Lees, and Olga, for coming out and, and sharing what's happening in your community with us. That's great. So, thank you.